So we want to first off apologize uh, for the technical problems. Uh, we, we uh, uh, due to some unforeseen uh, circumstances in Baghdad, are unable to bring you video today. We're going to be doing this by phone, but we're still doing it here in the briefing room because we wanted to afford uh, those in the outstations who might be watching the live stream of this the ability to continue to watch it. And before we get started, uh, uh, General Martin, just want to make sure you can hear us and we can hear you. I can hear you loud and clear, Adrian. Great, sir. Um, and then before we uh, uh, get uh, to your introduction, I just wanted to pass on another piece of information for all of you. Uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis will embark on his first trip as Secretary of Defense on February 1st to meet with his counterparts from two critical U.S. allies, Japan and the Republic of Korea. This four-day trip will include stops in both Seoul and Tokyo. Departing on February 1st, Secretary Mattis will begin his trip in the Republic of Korea, where he will meet with Minister of National Defense Han Kim, Han Min Koo, excuse me, and other senior Korean officials. And then on February 3rd, Secretary Mattis travels to Tokyo for meetings with Minister of Defense Tomomi Inada and other senior Japanese officials. The trip will underscore the commitment of the United States to our enduring alliances with Japan and the Republic of Korea and further strengthen U.S.-Japan Republic of Korea security cooperation. Now this morning, uh, we, it's my pleasure to introduce Major General Joe Martin. He's the uh, C. The C GIFLIC, which is the commanding general of the Combined Joint Forces Land Component Command uh, for Operation Inherent Resolve. He's also the commander of the 1st Infantry Division in Fort Riley, Kansas, better known to many of you as the Big Red One. Uh, general uh, Martin took this position in Iraq in November 2016. Uh, and as co commander of Coalition Joint Forces Land Component Command, General Martin leads the multinational force comprised of land, air, naval, marine, and special operations personnel charged with carrying out an operations under Operation Inherent Resolve Umbrella uh, to include the advice, assist, and enabling mission provided to Iraqi security forces working to liberate Mosul. And just for your understanding, and uh, uh, please, as you, as you uh, talk to him, keep in mind his responsibilities are limited to operations in Iraq. He's not... Uh, uh, the person who can uh, who can speak uh, best to Syria issues, and with that, uh, General Martin, I'll pause to turn it over to you for for uh, your uh, intro remarks. I'm going to depart the stage and turn it over to Major Ray, uh, Rankin Galloway, who will moderate uh, this event from here forward. Thank you, General. Well, good morning, everybody, and thanks for uh, listening today. I'm Joe Martin, the commander of the Combined Joint Forces Land Component Command, which includes all the coalition ground forces in Iraq. And I also command the 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One, out of Fort Riley, Kansas. Last night, after more than 100 days of tough urban combat, the government of Iraq and the Iraqi security forces announced the liberation of eastern Mosul. While clearance operations will continue, the Iraqi security forces control all areas inside of the, the, the city east of the Tigris River. This is a monumental achievement for the Iraqi security forces and one that would have, have been a difficult task for any army in the world. This is still a, there's still a difficult fight ahead in western Mosul, but the ISF has proven that they are both a professional and formidable fighting force. I want to take a moment to update you on the contributions, on our contributions to the success and momentum that the Iraqi security forces are having in Iraq. The Iraqi security forces have sustained success in eastern Mosul, liberating hundreds of thousands of civilians from Daesh. Daesh fighters have had their pay reduced. They've seen Fewer VBIDs, much less sophisticated, I would add, that are being used at any point in the ISF's effort to liberate Mosul. Daesh is increasingly unable to respond to the Iraqi security forces' pressure from multiple directions. I know most of you are interested in how long it's going to take to liberate the rest of Mosul. The truth is we don't know. What I do know is that the Iraqis have made significant progress in retaking a city about the size of Philadelphia in a fight that would be difficult for any army to execute. Mosul is about 145 square kilometers. It's got a population of 1.2 million people. It has over 200,000 structures and almost 3,000 kilometers of road to clear. The Mosul offensive is some of the hardest door-to-door -door fighting the world has seen in recent history. While I'm not going to go into specifics or predict how the Iraqis will take on Western Mosul, what I'll tell you is that it will be challenging. Daesh has had over two years to fortify its defensive positions 
and prepared supplies for that defense. Under these conditions, the government of Iraq and the Iraqi security forces are taking exceptionally great care to protect the lives of the thousands of civilians who remain in Mosul. Their safety is a primary consideration in the ISS ongoing effort to defeat Daesh and liberate Mosul. An unfortunate fact is that Daesh doesn't value human life. They continue to occupy protected civilian infrastructure such as hospitals, schools, and mosques. We know they've done this on the east side, and we can reasonably expect more of the same on the west side. As we talk about sustained success, it's important to understand the success the Iraqi security forces have had over the past two plus years. Think about it. Since September 2014, when the enemy was essentially at the gates of Baghdad, they've liberated over 2.4 million people, regained tens of thousands of square kilometers of ground, and liberated hundreds of hundreds of towns and villages. The Iraqi security forces have also secured vital resources, including the Mosul Dam, the Kiara oil fields, and the Beji refinery. And at the same time, the coalition has trained 11 brigades, more than 40 battalions, with just about 60,000 fighters during the same time period. As for the coalition mission, we advise, assist, and enable the Iraqi security forces with the goal of liberating Mosul and defeating Daesh in Iraq. We also build partner capacity by training and equipping them. When our leaders talk about dealing ISIL, a lasting defeat, it is this training that will enable it. We partner with the Iraqi security forces to build maintain, maintain momentum against a determined and entrenched enemy, and we'll go wherever the Iraqi forces go in order to do that. We also provide lethal strikes that are coordinated and, of course, approved by the Iraqi government. Force protection is my number one priority. It needs to be understood that there's always risk to coalition forces, no matter the distance from the close fight. That's just the nature of combat. We advise and assist Iraqi security forces down to the brigade level. This aspect of our mission is important to synchronize the actions of our partner forces and the actions of the coalition. This helps us to exploit Daesh's vulnerabilities, which continue to grow each and every day. With that in mind, Coalition forces are not here to fight for the Iraqis, but rather enable their success. We are, however, prepared to defend ourselves if necessary. Through our operations, the coalition has degraded Daesh's fighters on the front lines. We've disrupted their command and control apparatus and imposed an incredible strain on their leaders, industrial base, financial system, communications networks, and the system that they use to bring in foreign fighters to fill their rapidly depleting ranks here in Iraq. Daesh continues to be a parasite, relentlessly exploiting the people and infrastructure like hospitals, schools, and mosques, despite the international laws protecting those sites. The important thing to remember is that the Iraqi security forces and every nation in this coalition are united with the goal to liberate Mosul and defeat Daesh in Iraq. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. A couple of questions. Um, have you been given any additional or new direction um, to speed up the campaign, either land or air, in Iraq uh, and, or Syria, if, you're, if that's part of your, uh, your role? I, and do you, do you see room for uh, a bigger U.S. role in Iraq on the ground or in the air in terms of either larger numbers of U.S. forces or U.S. forces uh, being uh, operating more uh, further forward in in, uh, in Iraq. I'm sorry, I didn't get your name, but uh, what I tell you is that uh, we have seen an increase in the tempo, and it began on the 29th of December when the Iraqi security forces began conducting operations after they did, uh, in essence, a refit and a reorganization uh, after 60 days of tough fighting. Uh, the combination of their ground maneuver uh, created a condition where the enemy had to react uh, to uh, contact from multiple directions and in doing so revealed vulnerabilities that enabled us to target the enemy forces uh, at a significantly higher rate uh, than we had done before. Uh, our mission has not, uh, has not changed and I can't speculate on what may come, come uh, forward in the future. but. Currently, our mission has not changed, but that is the increase in the tempo that you may have uh, been observing since the 29th of December. 
follow up. Uh, General, this is Bob Burns from AP. Uh, just a follow up question. Um, uh, so you, you were saying you haven't been given any new direction from Washington um, on uh, US, the U.S. role there in Iraq. But do you, as a commander, do you see ways that would be fruitfully uh, exploited in which U.S. forces could, could operate further forward or take a bigger role on the ground or in the air? Bob, our role is exactly where it needs to be right now, and that's beside the Iraqis, advising, assisting, and enabling, and training them. And uh, it has worked uh, very well uh, since the 29th of December, and uh, we continue to plan on supporting them until they defeat Daesh. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Tara Kopp, Stars and Stripes. Thank you, General. Um, I wanted to know, did the Turks have a role in the fall of East Mosul? Um, the last time we were there, there were Turkish forces kind of to, I guess, the, the north and east of Mosul, and it was unclear what their role would be. And then I have a follow-up. The Turk, I'm sorry, could you say the question again? Did Turkish forces have a role in the fall of East Mosul? There were, um, in the late fall, there were around 2,000 or so Turkish forces, and it was unclear what their role would be in the uh, advance on Mosul. What you, what you saw was the result of Iraqi security forces. Uh, conducting operations in a simultaneous fashion against Daesh in eastern Mosul. Uh, the, Turkey, the Turkish did not have a role in that. So did those Turkish forces uh, withdraw from Iraq? Their presence had been a point of contention. Well, what I would tell you is uh, anybody who operates within the, within the country of Iraq uh, would, would, uh, should coordinate with and receive the approval of the governor of Iraq to, uh, to uh, operate within the country of Iraq. So I would ask the governor of Iraq that question, but I, I, I can't answer that question. Okay. And then uh, specifically with the uh, U.S. advisors, their role in the fall of East Mosul, um, how far into the city were advisors? Did they accompany their units all the way up to the river? or? Could you give us a sense of what they are doing now? I'm going to I'm going to tell you a story to help you get, give you a sense of exactly what they're doing. Uh, principally, they're with brigade and division level commanders, and so imagine a coalition force uh, advisor and his equipment and his team in the same vicinity of an Iraqi brigade commander or division commander. If they're together, they're fusing and sharing intelligence. If they're together, they're fusing and sharing a common operating picture, understanding exactly where the Iraqis are. And together, uh, with the Iraqis' approval, they're striking targets in a much more effective and uh, 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 quick fashion uh, in executing uh, those targets. And so they're side by side. They're building relationships. They're getting to know each other uh, better every day. And uh, that has created an incredible synergy in terms of uh, enabling the Iraqis' ground maneuver to achieve uh, unprecedented success and speed. The most recent success in East Mosul were those brigades in the city. Did the advisors go into the city with them? I'm sorry, I didn't answer your question. Uh, if that brigade commander at his command post is moving into the city, the advisors absolutely would be right beside that brigade commander in the city. Welcome. Okay. That brigade commander goes. Next we'll go to uh, Lori Milroy from Kurdistan 24. Uh, General, I have two questions. The first concerns the role of the Shia militias. Uh, news reports have them operating, that, that they're going to be part of the um, liberation of western Mosul and that they're operating now to uh, clear up the roads to Tikrit and um, Mosul. And given p earlier reports that they were abusive towards the Sunnis, the Sunnis were afraid of them. Do you have any concerns about the participation of the Shia militias in these operations? The Shia militia are to the west of Mosul, and they're exactly where the, Iraq, the governor of Iraq has asked them to be, uh, providing some uh, security to the west of the city. I'm not aware of them being inside of the city. Um, 
and uh, they're doing exactly what the government of Iraq has asked them to do. So they're operating under Iraqi command and control? They're operating under the command and control of the government of Iraq. And, and my second question concerns East Mosul. Now that it's liberated, I'm sure the coalition is learning a lot more about what, what Daesh was in, in East Mosul and how it was operating. Was there any particular role that the Chechens had? Were, were they significant or marginal in, in Daesh and East Mosul? I can't specifically comment as to uh, the, the activity specifically of the Chechens, but there are foreign fighters uh, that have fought in eastern Mosul, and there's other foreign fighters uh, that are in other places in Iraq. Uh, but I can't specifically comment on the Chechens. Could you say which, from where did most of the foreign fighters come? Is there some area that stands out mostly? No, there's no area that sticks out. They're from several countries. Thanks to Kasim uh, with uh, Anadolu. Thanks, General, for doing this. My question will be again about the, the hold force. Has the hold force started to move in uh, to, the, to the eastern Mosul to establish security over there? So my partner that I work with uh, each and every day uh, has placed a premium on the hold force, and they're in the process of uh, transitioning uh, from clearance operations in the hold force. And so just to give you a picture of this, uh, you know, they've, they've, they've cleared the east side, a uh, little over 100,000 buildings. If you think six rooms in each building, that's a, goal. That's a Herculean task. And so uh, what they're doing now is they're going back through and they're ensuring that everything is uh, clear and turning it over to hold forces. And it's a process that will take a little bit of time. Uh, but uh, Transitioning to that hold force is a high is a very uh, high priority for my security partner in the Iraqi security forces. Are you aware whether the Turkish trained uh, Sunni tribal fighters are going to be included in those hold force for the East Mosul? I, I don't have the answer to that question. Lastly, there, there is a presence of PKK terrorist group in Sinjar, and it has been a point of discussion between the Iraqi government, Turkey, and also uh, the Iraqi Kurdistan regional government. Are you aware whether they have withdrawn from the Sinjar or not? I can't answer that question either. Thank you. Right, next we'll move to Michael Gordon from The New York Times. Uh, sir, I have just uh, three quick qu questions. One's a clarification. The previous question. Uh, for the popular mobilization forces in Tal Afar, is the coalition providing any air support whatsoever for them, or are they more or less on their own? Are there any Iraqi forces um, co-located with them? That's, that's my first question, and I just have two quick follow-ups. Okay. Uh so your first question, uh, no, we're not providing air, air support to the PMF that's out to the west. Uh, my second question is, uh, Huija was bypassed in the push to Mosul, and then a counterattack was launched out of there into uh, Kirkuk. How are you dealing with Huija as a potential problem at this, uh, at this stage? Is it isolated? Or what is, how, is that, how are you dealing with that uh, ISIS-controlled area? Well, I don't want to comment exactly on how the Iraqis are dealing with that particular problem set, but uh, we're executing uh, what would what, what essentially is the government of Iraq's plan to defeat Daesh in Iraq. Uh, and so we're currently in Mosul, and we've had significant success on the east side of Mosul, uh, looking to go to hold on that side, and then we're going to move over to the west side of Mosul based on, based on current plan. Uh, the Iraqi security forces is mindful of, aware of, and uh, addressing uh, the, the threats that are emanating out of Hawija. Uh, but what, 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 what's really important for you to understand is what's emanating out of Hawija into different areas in the country is uh, the actions of an adversary who's desperate to draw the attention of the governor of Iraq away from their focus in Mosul. And the governor of Iraq is staying galvanized and focused on their goal. 
Last is just a clarification of the previous question. Uh, what is the hold force for eastern Mosul? Since you've told us it's been liberated, presumably uh, the hold force has been identified. So what is this hold force? Who, who is it? I can't give you, I don't have in front of me specifically the brigades involved, but it's a multiple brigade and multiple battalion, uh, multiple cohort force uh, that the Iraqi security force commander has picked himself uh, to go in there. Uh, and it'll be under the control of one of the division commanders, the 16th division commander, and the 16th division commander will command and control the east side of the river with that whole force in place once it has been transitioned from the clearing forces over to the whole force. Paul Shigman with U.S. News and World Report. Just a couple clarifying questions. Are there any Kurdish forces are currently operating in East Mosul? As I understood, the plan was for them to advance from the east, but then to hold and let the ISF do clearing. Is that still the case? Are there Kurdish forces there? Kurdish, the Kurdish forces executed their operations uh, before my time began here in Iraq, but they did a magnificent job setting conditions for the Iraqi security forces to continue the attack in the Mosul and they remain at that limit of advance that you spoke of in your question. Uh, great, thank you. And can you give us an estimate? Do you have any estimates on the number of ISIS fighters remaining in East Mosul, and then perhaps the number of fighters remaining in Mosul writ large? At, at this time, I can't. Uh, what I can tell you is their numbers are getting less every day. Uh, the Iraqi security forces have ousted them from East Mosul to West Mosul. What we've seen over the past uh, couple of days uh, is the enemy withdrawing across the Tigris River in boats, which we've struck multiple times. Uh, we see the enemy's uh, we see the enemy's capacity continue to wane. Uh, the sophistication of his weaponry continues to become lower and lower. These are all indicators of an enemy that's on the run. And uh, with that, uh, we take every opportunity we can to relentlessly pursue them with airstrikes to continue to shape conditions while the Iraqi security forces conduct their transition from one side of the city to the other. And then lastly, sir, do you expect that the fighting in West Mosul is going to be any different than what you've seen so far? Can you anticipate whether there are any uh, unique challenges that are, are present on that side of the city? And is crossing the river, for example, going to be a, a, a specific challenge? What I can't do is tell you exactly what it's going to be like, other than it's going to be challenging. And the reason it's going to be challenging is because what remains is a city about the half the size of Philadelphia, and so about 100,000 buildings. Uh, with an enemy that's had over two and a half years to prepare this defense. And this defense, they'll be much more uh, desperate than they were on the east side. Their confidence will be down. But uh, I think that uh, they'll continue to demonstrate that uh, there's no limitation to their despicability as they use the, hu the population as human shields. Uh, I can tell you they are occupying schools and hospitals right now, um, and we are uh, we are where we can, striking them exactly where we need to, to uh, further degrade their capability as they continue to prepare this defense. I would also add that uh, there's, uh, there's uh, what you typically see in a withering enemy, you start to see the leadership start to fall apart and you start to see people uh, questioning whether or not they want to continue with this cause. And we're seeing indicators of that as well. And so these are all good indicators that the enemy uh, is losing capacity and understands that the outcome of the fight in West Mosul is predictable. It's their defeat and Iraqi victory. Thank you. Now we'll move to uh, Carla Munoz from The Washington Times. Hey, sir, thanks for doing this. I wanted to follow up on your comments about uh, the upcoming siege of West Mosul. Uh, looking at what had happened, uh, can you, well, I guess, can you give me um, your assessment of what the threat is of civilian casualties in West Mosul compared to what you saw in the advance through the eastern part of the city? Well, 
what I got to tell you is uh, one of the many things that's impressed me about the Iraqi security forces and our strikes as we've done them is uh, how much care they take in protect, protecting the civilian population. Uh, they've taken great effort to do that. And uh, so I haven't heard about a lot of stories about um, that being a problem as the Iraqi security forces were conducting operations. Now, it makes it much harder on the Iraqi security forces because they've got to discriminate between the enemy and the, the civilians of the population, and oh, by the way, with an enemy that has no problem using the population to shield and cover their moves. I've got many examples of that. Um, then you contrast that with what DASH has done. You know, they're still taxing people on the west side of the city and any other area that they're occupying in the country. Uh, I don't know if you know it, but they're enlisting adolescents and handicapped people to do their bidding with suicide vehicle-borne IEDs and even uh, arming adolescents and having them uh, stay and remain in the vicinity of indirect fire firing platforms. I even had one report of one uh, a child being chained to an artillery piece. And then, of course, to make sure that they maintain control, uh, they're still conducting public executions and other methods to control the population. And so when you think about what the Iraqi security forces have done to be very mindful of protecting the civilian population in this very tough conflict and what DASH has, what, what DASH has done, I think the Iraqi security forces have done an amazing job. Understood, sir, but uh, I guess my question is, if the uh, threat of civilian, civilian casualties in West Mosul is the same as it was in the in the push through the east part of the city. Considering how dug in Daesh is in West Mosul, is there any consideration at all as the fight progresses on changing or loosening the rules of engagement for a, uh, coalition airstrikes in support of the offensive? We will conduct the fight the same way we've conducted the fight from the beginning, and that will be by assisting the Iraqis in any way that we can to ensure that they're successful in their mission. So rules of changing or loosening the ROEs for airstrikes is something that could be considered? I mean, is, that, is it off the table, or is it just something that you'll sort of keep on your list of options as the offensive progresses? Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be able to speculate on what the future will hold. What I'll tell you right now is that uh, we're going to continue this mission, and our focus is the defeated dash. Now to Corps Dick Team with Stars and Tribes. Uh, thanks, General. Um, I wanted to see, you talked about indicators uh, of the, you know, of the enemy kind of falling apart. Uh, are you seeing then, in that case, um, mass desertions or you know, people uh, giving up and turning themselves in, or can you expand on, on that at all? We are seeing indicators of desertions and other activities that would indicate uh, the, the, the structure and the, uh, the, 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 the cohesive organization of DASH starting to, uh, starting to crumble. Uh, and then just real quick, uh, is Western Mosul now, is it isolated um, specifically for, uh, on the west side of it from Syria? Can, can, is there any freedom of movement for, for ISIL? Well, as I stated before, uh, the, the government of Iraq has asked the PMF to be on the west, and that's where they are. And that's who's out there uh, securing the west side of Mosul at this time. Now, to Carla Bag with Voice of America. Thanks, General. Um, a few quick questions. First, you mentioned that um, some of the they, they were losing some of the leaders. What types of leaders are left in West Mosul? Can you talk about that? Um, IS leaders. Well, they're leaders that are facing a very formidable opponent uh, in the Iraqi security forces. They're leaders that are uh, that are less capable. Uh, than the leaders that started out with the defense of Mosul as a whole because we're targeting their supply resources, we're targeting their mission command structures, 
We're targeting every resource that they reveal to us, uh, maintaining continuous pressure on them uh, in preparation for the future offensive uh, that the Iraqis will execute on the west side. And so those leaders uh, have a significant, significantly less uh, amount of resources available to them that uh, their counterparts had in the east in terms of uh, command and control structure, uh, you know, uh, good subordinate leaders, uh, uh, full ranks below them. These leaders are leading formations that are less, uh, less in number, less in capability, and with that, clearly, uh, given human nature, probably less confident. And so uh, the Iraqi security forces uh, will continue to uh, prepare for offensive operations, and while, while they're doing that, we'll continue to uh, shape those uh, enemy resources uh, on the west side of the river to support that. Thanks, General. But are we talking about Islamic State that are kind of part of the council? I mean, how, how low down the, the totem pole are these leaders that are still left in Mosul? Are there any high-value targets still left in Mosul? I couldn't tell you which high-value targets, as you would say, are, are in western Mosul, but there's leaders leading military formations, and we're looking for each and every one of them and we'll strike them when we find them. And I also wanted to ask about the training. Uh, is the coalition training complete for Iraqi forces and hold forces and Kurdish forces? No, absolutely not. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, it's, the, the training continues. In fact, this week uh, we're, we're almost at capacity in all of our training centers, training uh, uh, training uh, thousands of Iraqis in collective and individual skills to continue to build upon, upon their proficiency, either build upon or, excuse me, uh, or sustain proficiency. When do you expect training to be complete? Do you have an estimate? Well, uh, I don't, but as, as a professional with uh, about three decades of service, I'll tell you that uh, we place a, a, a premium on training at all times. So training, I think, is, uh, is an enduring mission uh, for Iraq. And final question, um, since we're going into West Mosul, I know you've explained very thoroughly some of the capabilities lost by Islamic State. What have they done well, and what's the biggest challenge that you guys will have to face, that the Iraqis will have to face going into West Mosul? Well, considering all the things that I talked to you about, the, the, you know, you can't place a premium on their acts of despicability. Uh, the fact that they want to dominate the population, I find it hard to, uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to say they've done this well. That being said, uh, they're innovative, but so are we. And uh, they're, they're tenacious, but the Iraqis are more tenacious. Uh, two years, they were on the gates of Baghdad, and the Iraqi security forces have fought back over the course of that time. 2.4 million people liberated, 100, or excuse me, 32,000 square kilometers of liberated terrain. It's, it's, it's admirable and the results are undeniable. And so despite the fact that Daesh has some uh, ability to adapt to the environment, they can't do it quick enough, and the Iraqi security forces are going to prevail. Thank you, General. Christina Wong with Breitbart. Um, still at the Hill. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks for doing this, General. I have uh, two questions. Uh, you mentioned that ISIS is getting increasingly desperate um, as they're pushed into western Mosul. Uh, how do you expect that will manifest itself? Uh, would they possibly deploy chemical weapons, begin destroying buildings, increasingly use uh, civilians or target civilians? I can't comment on the chemical weapons, but I can tell you the east side of the river tells us that they'll burn and destroy infrastructure as they leave it. The fact that, that, that they blew up the bridges uh, as they completed their operations on the, or they had to withdraw from the, from the east side. Uh, the fact that they're occupying what we would consider to be sacred uh, municipal infrastructure right now indicates that uh, 
they will become more desperate and they'll do the same. Uh, you know, I, I refer to them as a parasite. If you think about what locust does uh, when it comes into a crop and strips it, strips it of everything that's worth anything on that crop, uh, that's what they're doing to the, uh, to the infrastructure in Mosul. And so uh, the Iraqis want to get want to want to get into Western Mosul, and they want to wrest control from Daesh and uh, stop this oppression and tyranny uh, that's been there since you know, for the past two years. Uh, just to follow up on that, um, as they target sacred infra infra sorry, infrastructure, do you, will we change our tactics as well? If they, if they defend from a school, uh, we will strike them where they defend. Um, and then just a, another uh, question. Um, can you describe what the current policy is in regards to ISIS fighters captured on the battlefield? Well, this is a sovereign nation, and the government of Iraq can best describe that to you. Um, they're the ones that detain them, and uh, they they have detained some uh, some uh, some ISIL fighters, uh, but they've done that. That's that's uh, you know as a sovereign nation, that's that's their uh, that's their call, and it's that that's their uh, prerogative. And then, uh, sorry, just to go back, I'd I'd be remiss if I didn't follow up. If we strike a school that ISIS is using, how do we ensure that there are no civilians um, also being targeted? I'm sorry, you broke up with a beep. Can you say that again, please? Yes, if we begin striking targets like schools, how do we ensure that we won't, uh, the U.S. will not, um, the coalition will not target civilians as well? Because we, we use a process that's really deliberate in targeting, uh, to validate targets so that we can protect civilian life. What I can tell you, uh, based on my experience, is the infrastructure that I've seen them use as a, as a command and control structure, uh, Al Salam Hospital comes to mind, uh, the several mosques that they've used, uh, they've kicked out uh, the people or the, 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 the service uh, that was, was in that particular structure out. In other words, uh, it was formally known as a school, formally known as a hospital, but no longer is functioning as such, and they've turned that into a facility that they conduct uh, supply operations, uh, command and control operations, and so uh, we have a very deliberate and thorough uh, process uh, using uh, several different forms of intelligence to uh, make these determinations, and of course, each and every one of these uh, strikes that we do is at the request of the government of Iraq. Uh, but that's how we arrive at the conclusion that we are not impacting the civilian populace. And in the after effects of some of these strikes is we've been able to go into Mosul University and look at the library and see that there was, that, that, that building had not been a library for two years. It had been a dash repository of records and other artifacts that they chose to keep there. Thank you. Ryan Brown with CNN. Thank you, uh, General, for doing this. Um, I had a couple follow-ups on some of the statements you made earlier. Uh, one, you said that the training was almost at capacity for the Iraqi uh, coalition efforts to train the Iraqi military. What is the constraint on the capacity? Is that the number of coalition trainers or kind of the size of the facilities? It's, 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 it's a function of facilities. It's a function of trainers available. When I say at capacity, it's just at any given time. I mean, some weeks we've got more, some weeks we got less, but we understand the capacity of our sites and we can expand that capacity if we need to. But uh, when I say we're at capacity, we're almost at capacity, it's uh, based on our prediction of what we can fill with the people we have and the sites we have. Okay, uh, and you talked a little bit about some of the challenges going into Western Mosul, the 100,000 buildings. Um, have the Iraqis requested any additional uh, support or capabilities to kind of enable this more challenging objective? Uh, well, I didn't characterize it as more challenging. I just said it would be challenging. But uh, what I would tell you is uh, they've asked for us to be by their side as they continue on. Uh, in fact, uh, 
I got a note about that this morning. And of course, we're going to be there right beside their side, advising, enabling, and assisting them as they conduct operations. Okay. And, and finally, um, I know we have, you said we're primarily at the brigade level advisory, but we've gone down to the battalion level on a case by case basis in the past. I think one of that was a bridging operation uh, to assist the Iraqis do that. Um, obviously, all the bridges have either been destroyed or uh, disabled. Uh, so I imagine, do the Iraqis have the ability to conduct bridging operations independent of the coalition advisor? Uh, that was that was all before my time, but I've 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 talked to enough folks to tell you. Uh, they absolutely can do that on their own now, and that's a, that's one of many great examples of where, uh, in the past, they needed a little bit of assistance, a little bit of advisory skills, a little bit of help, and uh, the coalition was there to uh, provide that advisory capacity. Uh, but their most recent bridge that they laid uh, a month and a uh, month and a half, two months ago, uh, they did all by themselves. The engineering regiment did it all by themselves, and so. They have the capacity and the capability to do that all by themselves now. Okay, thank you. Thanks to uh, Louis Martinez with ABC. Hi, sir. Um, can I, you, in your opening statement, you talked about how this is some of the most intense urban fighting in, in recent memory. Uh, can you give us a sense of the level of casualties that the Iraqi forces suffered uh, during that fighting? And also, do you have a sense for the, um, an estimate of how many ISIS fighters may have been killed in the fighting? I, I, I can't give you, uh, for, for two different reasons, I can't give you uh, the uh, exact number of casualties. It's a matter of policy. We don't talk about any of our friendly casualties. But uh, as, far as, as far as enemy casualties goes, it would be impossible for me to give you exactly what the number is. And if I could follow up, um, there have been reports this week that uh, some schools have reopened in East Mosul. Um, it, is, is there like a fluctuating security um, environment in East Mosul? Um, is that what that indicates? I mean, where some areas are hotter than others? Well, in a challenging fight like this, uh, it's going to be it's going to be a, uh, a a security environment that's going to change uh, with each day. But what I can tell you is, uh, post liberation, the Iraqis are doing everything they can to ensure that uh, they didn't miss anything in their clearance and uh, the whole forces take over areas that are secure that you know that's a foundation that's a foundation of uh, every measure of stability beyond that you got to have that foundation of security the Iraqis are mindful of that and uh, they're doing everything they can to uh, ensure that uh, they maintain that foundation of security which leads to stability uh, and you know they're they're very mindful of the fact that those essential services uh, need to find security that leads to stability because those essential services follow stability. And the opening of schools is a good indicator of, number one, their attention and mindfulness of uh, normalizing uh, what has been two years of tyranny and oppression uh, in eastern Mosul as quickly as possible but doing it in a way that's safe so that the children are protected when they go into schools and the neighborhoods that uh, they've absolutely uh, uh, gone back through and cleared and ensured that uh, there's no other remnants of war or, uh, or uh, enemy forces. Now to Tony Capasio with Bloomberg. Hi, sir. I have a couple of tactical questions. Uh, to what extent is the A-10 and the AC-130 gunships being used in urban areas in Mosul? I have a follow-up. So we're using both of those, and that's a, with a suite of highly sophisticated, incredible coalition aircraft uh, that we have available to strike dash uh, at any time and place of our choosing. Um, but we're also complement those aircraft with some surface to surface capability that is also equally sophisticated, allowing us to do precision strikes at a time and place of our choosing against Dash to keep them on the run and continue to uh, to uh, erode away his capacity. There's a lot of interest in Washington, as you know, about the A-10. Can you give a couple examples of how it's being able to uh, 
surgically strike urban area, urban uh, sections of muzzle? I, I can't. I, I'm not an Air Force pilot. I'm just a CJ flight commander. But uh, I, what I can tell you is that the uh, coalition air capacity that we have and the capability we have is incredible. You know, 19 countries um, or uh, uh, several countries committed to the same cause, eliminating Daesh from the country of Iraq. To what extent has offensive cyber been used in this operation to disrupt Daesh command and control? I can't comment on tactics, techniques, and procedures that uh, we use to uh, to degrade the enemy's uh, mission command systems or uh, the greatest capability. General, though, Secretary Carter has talked about the use of offensive cyber. I mean, but this is a good example. You might be able to give us a good, at least, a broad overview of how it's being used in this tactical situation. I can't talk about the tactics, techniques, and procedures that we use against the enemy here. Thanks. It's to Lucas Thompson with Fox News. General Martin, is the U.S. military still operating under the authorities uh, from the prior administration? Well, our mission has not changed, and we're operating under the exact same set of authorities. And just to be very direct here, so since President Trump took office, there's not been any change of orders or uh, orders to ramp up airstrikes against ISIS? Our orders here have not changed since the 20th of January. And finally, the Prime Minister of Iraq has initiated an investigation into some of these Shia militias accused of some retribution uh, of uh, Sunnis outside Mosul and in around the city. Uh, has the U.S. military seen any evidence of this retribution? Uh, I can't recall any evidence of this retribution, uh, but what I can tell you is, uh, you know, the PM has a zero tolerance policy, and uh, it's because any retribution from anybody is unacceptable behavior, and it is not conducive to uh, further stabilizing the country beyond this conflict and the tyranny of Daesh. And so, uh, as you heard, the Iraqis will make an investigation. They'll do their investigation, and I'm sure we'll hear from them after they, uh, after they uh, complete their investigation. Carla Babb with Voice of America. Thank you, General, for indulging me on one last Iraq question. There have been reports out of Syria that there's infighting in the, among the jihadist groups there as uh, more and more strikes have been occurring and as territory is being lost by Islamic State. Have you seen anything similar in Iraq? So we have. Uh, I can't get into detail exactly uh, as to, 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 to how I've arrived at that conclusion, but uh, I, would, I would assert to you that there has been infighting amongst the ranks uh, and amongst the different cohorts of Daesh. And this is, these are typical indicators of an enemy that's becoming desperate and uh, his structure and his capability is crumbling below him. And so you'll see some of this infighting uh, it's, it's, it's something that uh, is somewhat uh, expected. Have you seen Al-Qaeda or other groups try to move in on Daesh territory? I have not. Thank you, sir. Sir, could you give your name and affiliation? I'm with India Globe in Asia today. My question is that now we have a new administration, a new president. What do you think the future will be as far as going after all these terrorists and uh, how much role or what role do you think India can or is playing? Thank you, sir. I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I could not understand you. The question was, now with the uh, new administration, what role, what, what do you see for the future of uh, operations against terrorist groups, and what role do you see India playing in those operations? Over. I can't speculate on what the future is going to hold. What I can tell you is that uh, we're going to stay here with this 19-country coalition and the uh, CJ flick in Iraq, and we're going to stay right beside the Iraqis and continue to the finish line of defeating Daesh in Iraq. And, Sir, go ahead. Oh, one, one follow-up. Uh, 
Since 19 uh, coalition countries are here, there are 67 countries fighting in uh, uh, Syria. And do you have any, uh, any uh, connection with these two, uh, 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 with 67 countries fighting in Syria and other places? As the commander of Iraq, I really can't answer any questions authoritatively on Syria. Sir, could you get your name and affiliation, please? Politico. General, just a quick follow-up. Have you been asked, you said you haven't had any new authorities, but have you been asked for any recommendations, have you offered any on changes to, say, rules of engagement or the tempo? No. And look, you know, I know some, some, some folks come in the room a little bit later, but just let me reiterate this point because I think it's, I think it's a good one to drive home. Um, so uh, around uh, the end of one administration, beginning of a new one, you, you saw that there was a change in operations here, but it was a function of the Iraqis taking an operational uh, opportunity to reflect on what had happened in the first 60 days. They changed a couple things up, they moved a couple units around, and uh, they synchronized their actions. And so you've seen an increased tempo as a result of unadulterated Iraqi decision making on the way they want to conduct operations. And we, uh, as a result of that, with our advisory capacity, have been able to help them uh, with our strikes uh, because of the activities that they the, they, they've uh, forced the enemy to do uh, while attacking in the way they're attacking. And so that's really the reason that there's been an increased tempo. And you can go back statistically uh, to the 29th of December, and that was the day that was the day that uh, that began, and maybe not statistically, but uh, that's when the tempo really increased, and it was a result of those operations. I think we have time for one more question. Going once, going twice. Uh, thank you very much. General, do you have any closing words for us? I just, uh, I just want to thank you all for uh, being there and, uh, as I started off with, uh, listening to me. Um, please tell our story. Tell the story of what uh, what's going on over here in Iraq. This country has done an incredible job uh, fighting a very uh, resilient uh, and adaptive foe, but uh, Iraq is committed, and as we are in the coalition, to defeating Daesh here. That's all I've got. Sir, thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much.